Amen. Please be seated. If you have your Bible, would you take it out and turn with me to the book of Acts and chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Paul is, uh, continues to be in Ephesus, where there is a great work of the Spirit of God going on. One of the things uh, that we see here is how uh, Christians, believers, suffer from uh, blind spots, suffer from uh, spiritual blindness, and yet uh, the, the apostle and Luke, his assistant, believe, call them believers, uh, even though uh, they have not yet been fully sanctified. We'll see how uh, the Spirit of God does that work here. I, I want to see, uh, want to see with you how God has patiently dealt with His people in Ephesus, triumphing over the imitators of His of His gospel. Let's pray as we look to God's word. Father in heaven, please build up your church. Please free us from, from despair. Enable us to come to you in faith. Enable us to come to you with abiding and transcendent joy because of what you have done for us in your beloved Son. Father, we do pray that you would fill us with a love for him, fill us with passion for holiness, that we may truly hate our sin, that we would indeed, as the Apostle Paul calls us, present our members as instruments of a righteousness. And so, O Holy Spirit, work in our members even this hour ahead of us and tonight that our minds and hearts would be fixed on Christ and his kingdom. For we pray in his name. Amen. Exodus, I'm oh, sorry, Acts. Acts 19. You know, we were in Exodus 19 this morning, weren't we? Acts 19, beginning at verse 8. Speaking of the Apostle Paul, Luke tells us, And he enters the synagogue, and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. But the evil spirit recognized them. And he said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize. But... Who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped upon them and mastered them all and overpowered them. So that they fled out of his house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And the fear of the Lord fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Amen. This far in God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. And let's look at God's power. In Ephesus, verses 8 to 12, Paul has ministered in the synagogue, and we see a little bit of his method here. The content of his message 
is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is central to the gospel. Jesus' words at the last Passover supper showed us the centrality of the kingdom of God. You remember what he said, I won't eat of it, I won't drink of it again until the kingdom of God comes. And the kingdom of God is coming, it is still coming, it's here, but it's also coming. The kingdom of God is brought in by the person and work of Christ, particularly his suffering, rising, and his reign at the end of times, the new age of the spirit. And it comes in the lives of people through the preaching of the gospel. Paul, interestingly, is not said to preach Christ here. But he's preaching the kingdom of God. Remember what Jesus discussed with the disciples in the 40 days after the resurrection. He discussed the kingdom of God. And so Paul is discussing the same thing. Because the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ are interchangeable, aren't they? You can't have the kingdom. And you can't have the king without the kingdom. But that will become a sticking point with the Jews later on, won't it? They want to have the kingdom of God, but they don't want that sort of king. They want God's kingdom as it was when, in the glory days of David and Solomon. Many Jews desire to have God's reign without a suffering Messiah. They associate, they associate the kingdom of God with that geopolitical entity that was ruled by David and Solomon, that empire. But the kingdom of God that Paul preaches is not so small. It transcends politics. Paul doesn't alter his focus, even though what the Jews want is politics. Rather, he spends his time reasoning, arguing, and persuading regarding Christ, pressing the claims of God in Christ on his hearers. And so he proclaims the kingdom of God. The pattern of the apostle sets the priority for the church and for our preaching. He spends three months in this synagogue. and this is the longest tenure he will have in a Jewish synagogue up to now. Initially, the Jews were respect, receptive to Paul's ministry. There was extensive Jewish influence in this province, and they tolerate Paul's preaching for three months. But their lack of initial hostility should not be mistaken for acceptance, should it? Tolerance, interest, politeness should not be mistaken for assent, agreement, or support. In fact, after this point, the Jews will continue to undermine and mislead the church for years after. If you read Paul's letter to the, the church at Galatia, you see how the Jews liked much of what Paul proclaimed, but not all of it. And so they tolerate this teaching until it becomes offensive to them. Many like much of what they're hearing, but they don't like all of what they're hearing. And so they will embrace a modified form of Paul's preaching, a modified form of Paul's gospel. You see, those heresies that plagued the church in the early days, many of them had a Jewish influence. As they argued for a limitation on who could be saved. As they required some preparation by man, that a person must become a Jew in order to be saved. Yes, you must have Jesus, but he must become a Jew and live in conformity to certain laws. You see, the Hebrews who may have believed much of the gospel message, understood that it meant they would lose their pride of place before God. They could not abandon certain aspects of their Jewishness, their Hebrew identity as critical to belonging to God's people. And so they seek to force Gentiles to act like Jews. And so Paul receives a lengthy hearing in the synagogue. But eventually, his teaching becomes offensive to Jewish, to Hebrew ideals of ethnic and racial superiority. But their ethnic identity was not central to becoming right or being right with God. And so Paul has to leave. So you remember that the Jews, the Hebrews, were horribly racist people. Now there are some today who would define racism as prejudice plus power. In fact, that definition underlies a recent book written by one of my uh, colleagues at seminary. Uh, it's fairly prominent in our circles, but it is fundamentally flawed because of how the author defines racism. When we define racism as prejudice plus power, it means we cannot deal with the heart of the matter. 
And it leads us to focus on sociology rather than spirituality. After all, the Jews, the Hebrews, are horribly racist people, but they have absolutely no power. They have very little clout throughout the empire. Yet as it, it becomes clear throughout the book of Acts that the Jews, the Hebrews, are terribly racist people. They are, and we'll see this clearly later, content to listen to Paul's gospel until they learn the good news of God's salvation in Christ means that the Gentile nations can be part of the kingdom of God on the same level as Hebrews. And as we'll see when we come to Jerusalem the final time, upon that very word, upon hearing that God's gospel goes to the nations, to the ethne, to the ethnics, upon that word, the Jews will call for Paul's execution. The Jews, remember, have no political power, but they are racist. And so don't buy into the Marxist materialist idea that is very popular today and gaining ground in our own Presbyterian church in America. Do not buy into the idea that prejudice plus power is racism. Because racism is often the response of powerless people looking for some reason that they are superior to their oppressors, superior to those with political power. That's not always how racism manifests itself, but it often does. You see, for the Hebrews of the first century, their privileged status in God's old economy under the old covenant meant that they were superior to Gentile dogs. Even though it was the Gentile dogs who had all the power. You see, their racism, their racist attitude was their consolation. And their racism leads them to reject the gospel. And so you see in verses 9 and 10, Paul is expelled from the synagogue. As usually happens, some Jews grew weary of the gospel's free grace, emphasizing repentance and faith and access to God in Christ rather than through works of the law and ceremonies and Hebrew prominence among the nations. And so Paul, along with the disciples, don't miss that. It's not just that Paul leaves the, the synagogue. He takes the disciples with them. Many Hebrews were not racist, but those who controlled the synagogue were. Many Hebrews did not reject the gospel, but those in power in this synagogue did. They are stubborn in their unbelief. They are hardened against the gospel and those who have embraced the Messiah as proclaimed by the apostle. See, it, there's a huge shift required in the worldview of the Hebrews to embrace Christ. The Hebrews considered themselves special in God's plan. And indeed, the Hebrew commonwealth did have a special place in God's plan until the coming of Christ, until the coming of the kingdom of God. But now the gospel has gone to all nations. As Paul will write to the Romans in Romans 3, we read a few weeks ago, what then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. We have already charged that all, both Jew and Greek, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. And so there Paul makes it clear that no nation is better off than another. There is no advantage. Advantage. There is no advantage. You can put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, there is no advantage to being a Jew if you reject Christ. Yes, under the old economy, there were many advantages. They had the whole revelation and oracles of God. But if they reject Christ, there is no advantage. And so we must be wary of thinking we have some national or ethnic advantage. Americans are susceptible to this line of thinking too. Often Americans think their country has a special place in God's plan. Uh, for example, some time ago there was a movement that announced all soldiers go to heaven. And presumably it meant all American soldiers. And I don't think the soldiers in the walk were intended there, but maybe they were, I don't know. Uh, but the, the, I think the intent was that all American soldiers go to heaven. Because people believe this country is special. That, this, that service to this country entitles one to spiritual merit or a special place of divine favor. Or that America has a special place in God's plan. And that's not the case at all. Likewise, Hebrews were very resistant to the idea that their ethnicity, that their nation is just one nation amongst many on the earth now. Hebrews were very resistant to the idea that they must abandon all hope except for Christ. 
That they must come to God in Christ on the same terms as Gentiles. And if the gospel means that they are no longer special, many of them oppose it. And to the unbelieving Hebrews, you see, speak ill about the gospel, about God's people, about God's ministers. Because they do not like the message that is proclaimed. They do not like the implications of Paul's gospel. They engage in a feverish attempt to oppose and undermine the new covenant church. But they're unsuccessful. Paul and the disciples remove from the synagogue. And they take up residence in a lecture hall. Remember, many of those disciples came from the Jewish synagogue. We mustn't think that the Gentile regions were entirely composed of Greek Christians. Especially in a place like Ephesus or Corinth, we should assume that many Hebrews came to faith in Christ along with their Gentile neighbors. And so, at least at the beginning, these churches had a very Hebrew character. Well, they take up residence in the Hall of Tyrannus. I'm not sure whether Tyrannus is the owner of the, of the hall or the local philosopher who also uses the hall. Some manuscripts suggest, and you see that note in the ESV, some manuscripts suggest that Paul preaches there from 11 in the morning until 4 o'clock each day. That would have been the hottest part of the day. That would have been the time of day when it was the cheapest to rent a hall. And so that's when they're there. And he does so for two years. That's five hours a day for two years, preaching and teaching. Incidentally, um, that's more hours of lecturing and preaching and teaching, more hours of, of that for the church at Ephesus than would be in a Master of Divinity degree. And so those people in Ephesus, the saints there in Ephesus, if they were able to attend most or all of Paul's lectures, would have had more theological training than I have. Paul changes his location. But you know what he doesn't change is his method or his message. Even after he's rejected by the synagogue, he goes and he preaches. And what happens? All Asia hears the word through Paul or secondhand through his scholars. And so we should see the way of application. How Paul's priority is on the word. Preaching it, teaching it, discussing it with the people of God and other interested people. Making it available to all who wish to come and hear the word of salvation. You see, God's grace matures the believers through teaching and preaching. God's grace grows the church through teaching and preaching. The message and method of the church remain unchallenged years. Though the circumstances do change. Let's look at verses 11 and 12. We have some miraculous works. Uh, this echoes back to chapter 5. And verses 15 and 16, in which Paul, in the early days of Jerusalem, uh, there were extraordinary deeds performed by God through articles of clothing that had come into contact with the apostles. Here, now, uh, that happens again. Was well, this magic? No, this is not magic. This is a work of God giving credence to Paul as an apostle and as a preacher, as he accommodates to the expectations of the locals to magnify his name. And so the name of Jesus is preached by Paul and is demonstrated as powerful. It's so powerful, it's imitated. And let's look at that, verses 13 and 16. This is the second thing I want to, I want to see with you tonight. Imitation and impotence. Some Jews have embraced a magical worldview, a spiritual worldview that is like that of the Ephesians, where names were thought to have spiritual power, where spells incantations and special knowledge enabled one to perform spiritual feats to make a name for oneself and so such people misunderstood the preaching of Jesus as merely another magical spirit by whom they could manipulate other spiritual forces we come across the sons of Siva verses 14 to 16 now there's no high priest recorded named Siva Though perhaps this is meant to be chief priests. Now there were many chief priests. Uh, there were seven brothers who presumed to cast out a demon using the name of Jesus as Paul proclaimed. But these seven brothers have neither legitimacy nor the spiritual integrity to do so. And so it's, it's quite comical, isn't it? How does the demon reply? Well, I, I know Jesus. 
I recognize Paul, but who are you? And then he turns on them, beats them, and they leave the house naked and bleeding. They are both discredited and embarrassed. They also are minions of Satan, and these minions of Satan have no power over other minions of Satan. No authority to cast out a demon. And so Satan subjects his minions, the sons of Siva, to his own cruelty. But contrast this with Luke 8. Jesus, one man, encounters another man who is naked and possessed by several spirits. And Jesus casts out those several spirits and the naked demon-possessed man is clothed and in his right mind. So we should beware spiritual imitation. But let's look at the fruit of God's power, verses 17 to 20. These Jewish exorcists had quite a reputation, apparently. And yet they are overpowered by a demon. At the same time, though, the demon acknowledges Christ's authority and that of his servants. The demon seemed to be acknowledging, look, if you actually knew Jesus, and if you actually had the authority that Paul has as an apostle, I would be forced to submit and so he acknowledges both Christ's authority and that of the Apostle Paul. And so this exposure of imitation leads people to value the genuine article, doesn't it? And so the fear of God overwhelms that region. People are impacted by this event as the false religionists are exposed and as the true power of Christ is revealed. And this, again, should remind us of the response to people in Jerusalem in the early stages of the apostolic church. As fear and awe fell upon all the people because the church was living faithfully. Well, here, too, people are seeing the foolishness of magic and the power of Christ. And it leads them to fear and to exalt the name of the Lord Jesus. And that fear is not limited only to those outside of the church. God uses this occasion to expose the folly of magical worldviews, the occult, and how they are incompatible with the gospel. It seems as though even those who had embraced Christ continued to practice magical arts. Even those who had spiritual awakenings and who had sat under the preaching of the Apostle Paul had blind spots in their lives. A great many believers continued to, on some level, subscribe to the magical arts, while at the same time professing faith in Christ. They had come to public repentance. And yet their repentance, as is always the case in this life, their repentance was incomplete. Were they hedging their bets? I don't think so. I think what was happening here, I think this is an example of how believers fail to appreciate the reign of Christ over all of life. They failed initially to see how firmly the world held on to them. You see, they were believers, but they were also part of a culture. And part of their culture was a belief in magic and, and the occult. And while they were saved out of that culture... The gospel does not always suddenly expose every aspect of a culture's hold on people. The gospel does not always suddenly expose every area in which their culture is incompatible with the kingdom of God. And so after seeing this, they realized, look, we, 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 can't, we can't continue to practice magic and, and use names and, and conjuring spells. Because that's, that's the devil's work, they see. We see how patient God is with his people, isn't he? He bore with these people as they slowly came to understand how pervasive the kingdom of God is. And how far removed from the kingdom of God their culture is. They apparently did not immediately see the conflict between magic and and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. But even though they didn't initially see that conflict, Luke calls them believers. Believers who had hidden sins. Believers who were not fully sanctified. 
and these hidden sins having been exposed, they repent of them. Were they thus far unwilling to part with such valuable property, such valuable treasure for the sake of the kingdom of God? Well, apparently not. Apparently they held on to those books. Maybe they were trying to sell them on eBay and, and, and recoup some of the, the, the expense. I don't know. But for whatever reason, they were unwilling to part with this valuable property until now. And so they've been brought to conversion, and now they are brought to conviction of sin for another layer of their rebellion against God. They have seen not only the futility and impotence of magic, but also the danger of trifling with it. The insult that it is to God and his providence. And so what do they do? They burn the books. They burn the scrolls. They not only confess and divulge their practices, they no longer, they not only cease from practicing magic, but they repudiate their former actions publicly by burning the means of engaging in those practices. They not only confess and divulge, they repudiate their former actions. They make an irreversible break with a magical worldview with their former sins. Their burning of those magical books demonstrates repentance, doesn't it? You see, repentance and faith that have no impact on a lifestyle, that's not true repentance. That's not true faith. Many of them were true believers, but they had come to deeper, greater understanding of their sinfulness and the way their lifestyle was out of conformity with Christ. They were following the society around them rather than living in submission to the word of God. And having come to conviction, they repent of their sins. All Christians have blind spots like these. Many in our part of the world have them on issues of ethnicity. And many in our circles just assume that we, the, the way we're used to things is the way things ought to be and reflective of Christian values. And it's true. We must not assume that white, middle-class, Anglo-Saxon values and priorities are necessarily and universally Christian ideas. But because blind spots, by definition are difficult for a person to see. But an outsider can reveal them. And that's one of the reasons the church is so important. Because we can see each other's sins. And we can encourage one another to turn from sin and support one another in our turning from sin. And so in God's providence, the folly of their devotion to magical principles is exposed. They burn their books and the price of what was burned amounts to 50,000 silver pieces. That's a lot of, a lot of money. That would be enough to feed 100 families for more than a year, I'm told. This was no small sacrifice, was it? But that's always the case with repentance, isn't it? Repentance of our own sins is always costly. We would much rather confess other people's sins, wouldn't we? We've, we've talked about that before. It's something that folks on the left wing and on the right wing will do. They're, they're, they'll confess the sins of other people, right? It, it wasn't that long ago. I think it was when, you know, especially when Clinton was president, you'd have all these preachers confessing national sins and immorality and, and all things like that, but never focusing on, on greed and deception. It was popular in the PCA not that long ago, too. To confess the sins of, of other people from long ago, but not to confess our own sins right now as a church. We should be aware that we don't fall into the trap of confessing other people's sins. That when we come to times of public confession and private confession, be sure you're confessing your own sins and not the sins you see in other people. And as you confess your sins, you will find your repentance costs you more and more. And yet the more that you repent, the more content in Christ you will become. How do I know? Well, look at what happens in verse 20. These people commit, they make a costly repentance. But what happens? Verse 20, the word increases and prevails mightily. That's a summary statement. For Luke, this is a section break. Another segment of Acts is coming to close. Very quickly, Paul's focus will shift on getting to Jerusalem. 
and then on to Rome to minister. But why has the word of God increased and prevailed mightily? Well, because the spirit of God is working, but also because people see Christians living consistently, lovingly, faithfully, winsomely, in a way that is different from the world around them and in submission to the word of God. And that lifestyle is attractive. It draws people in. Christian growth, notice here, Christian growth is hampered by inconsistent members. But as those members come to repentance, the word increases and prevails. Church growth is not halted by inconsistent Christians. Church growth is bolstered as the word and spirit have a transformative impact on the people of God, which in turn impacts the community. And so the word of God continues to go forth in spite of opposition and imitation. As yet again, opposition forces will gather because prophets are threatened, as we'll see next Lord's Day. And yet, God powerfully brings people to repentance and faith to the preaching of Christ and the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the whole earth belongs to you. And we pray that your kingdom would come to be on this earth as it is now in heaven. That the new heavens and the new earth would dawn. As we look around and see the, the decay and the sorrow and the hardships of this world and life. Let these afflictions strengthen our affection for heaven. And for Christ's fullness to be in our midst. Hear us, we pray, for his sake. Amen. Let's stand and take up our bulletins and we'll sing... Uh, Psalm 93 together. Mm -hmm.